This right here is Alexi's Grabber's Flyer. He did this test by an infrared. So you're going to see heat pick up and it looks more pink than it does when it's not in heat. Now, the black spots you see or the darker spot you see don't have a lot of heat on them at all. And then you're going to see things that are cold that will show up as ghost images. Anyway, this is really interesting. I'm going to go ahead and point everything out. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is the upper and lower rotating discs. I want you to notice in the center of them it looks black. It's dark. There's not a whole lot of heat going on there at all. And then we get to the edges. And those things, they have a lot of heat. You see them show up in a light pink color. That signifies that there's heat going on there. So there's magnetism going on there. We saw this also in our high voltage experiment. So let me show you a picture of that. As you can see, the plasma goes to the center disk. Now, in the high voltage experiment, we're using way too much energy going in there. So you can see the plasma forming. Now, you can only see Alexis under infrared. It doesn't mean the distance is wrong. It means the amount of energy we're using is wrong. In this one, we're using 20 kilovolts. So in Alexis, he's just using a DC flyback transformer in order to produce this type of field. Now that we know that this process is going on, let's now take a look at the infrared testing Alexi did, and we'll see that it shows up right in front of us. We can clearly see the upper and lower disc. We can also see the heat coming off of the outside of it. It shows up in a real pink color. The one thing about this that I'm not seeing, we saw the center plate, we know that it's in there, but in this image, it's not showing up very well. It's like a ghost image. It's You can see the outline of it barely, but you're not necessarily seeing the disc. There's a reason for that. We have cold energy going into it from the Tesla coil. So how do I know it's cold energy? Well, this is what Alexi did. He turned on his Tesla coils. We can see it lights up a light bulb. There's no problem there. He's going to fiddle with hooking in a wire right there to the bottom and then put it down the center of his Tesla coil. So, here's how you know when you get cold from hot energy. Right now, the light bulb lights up on hot energy. However, as soon as he puts the wire down it, now look, he's going to touch the base. It's now going to pull the energy in. So, just think of that base just like you do the gravity flyer. It's going to pull the energy into it just like cold energy. Let's take another look at the infrared image here. As we can see that the center plate looks like it's cold. Therefore, it doesn't show up with a lot of pink on the infrared. We can see the upper and lower plates are warm on the outsides of them. Now we're getting to the fact of what Alexi's trying to do here. He's building the cold energy in the center plate. What happens when you have hot energy with cold energy? The hot energy constantly goes to the cold energy. Therefore, the two plates are sucking into the center plate and pulling the energy to that center plate. Because it's aluminum, it does not want to stay on the center plate. Therefore, it's going to go to the outside. As you can clearly see in this image, we're starting to get a field built up on the outside of that center plate. Not a lot, but just a little bit. That means that the actual energy is traveling from the upper plate to the lower plate. Let's take a minute to draw this out. We can see that we put our Tesla coil field in the center and then we drew our high voltage field on the upper and lower plate combining around the outside of it. Now, when you energize the Tesla coil, what happens is it's going to push the high voltage field that is produced by the upper and lower plate. It's just going to move it out a little bit. So you get what we see here in the picture. Now, the first thing that we have to do is be able to contact the top to the bottom. So we need very weak magnets in order to put a bigger field that will go around to the top plate. And then we need to make sure we thin out our high voltage enough where it can spray on the outside a little bit and continue those lines that go right there with the magnet. And you're going to be just thickening that magnetic field right there is what you're doing. And then the Tesla coil field pushes it out ever so slightly when you first start them both up. Now that we understand where the field is and where it's being created at, let's go ahead and take a look at what Alexi does here. 
he's going to go ahead and blur his camera a little bit. Now, there's a trick to this. He's going to show you the actual field going around the center plate, the top plate, and the bottom plate. You'll start to see a field grow all the way around it. Let's zoom it in and take a closer look. As you can see on the picture on your left, you're seeing the field around it. On the right, I identify the field for you. So, we can clearly see when he blurred his camera that that's the actual field going around the top plate, the bottom plate, and the center disc. That means the field is not going around the entire craft. It's creating a bubble right there. Right where the, all the energy is, is where it's creating the bubble. Now that we know what the fields are in the gravity flyer, let's take a look around at the rest. You see those little things buzzing across your screen there? They go up, they start to float, you're seeing them going back and forth. Those are not things that are happening with the camera. That's actual energy in the air. The gravity flyer itself, when it starts the resonance and everything like that, and you start getting the fields of energy, you start to get a point where you're getting energy swirling around this thing. It's not necessarily wind. It's energy itself. Another thing to look at here is you see the little pieces of tinfoil it's got on top of all the sticks everywhere. That also tells you it's not wind flow. He's not getting a lot of air in here. He's got them both by the gravity flyer and up by the camera. That's not the effect that's going on in here. He's producing energy that's swirling. Because he's doing that, other energy wants to get to it. So it starts swirling, and it starts to behave differently in this type of field. I think it's a good time to answer this type of question right here. Why is in some of it he puts magnets on the top disc and the bottom disc? Well, if you're looking to produce a magnetic field, and that's what couples the bottom plate and the top plate together, he was thinking that you could put magnets on the bottom, and since that's locking in the bottom to the top plate with that magnetic field, he could probably do the same with the top to bottom. What's the problem? You have two opposing fields. Because the magnets only go in one direction, when you put magnets on the top and the bottom, it creates two opposing fields. That is a problem. It will not let you produce the bubble you see here. It will produce something that pushes out towards the center plate and goes out. That is very bad here. That's why he went back to magnets on the bottom disc only. Let's go back for a few minutes to the Tesla coil putting out cold energy. Now, we know it's cold. We see again here. We see Tesla coil. We saw the center right here. The center plate is cold. Now, what happens when you give feedback to the Tesla coil? Let me show you a video of what happens when you're at a resonance on a Tesla coil. This is the same process that will happen when you get feedback on a Tesla coil. So I have set up here my Variac. It's going into a full bridge rectifier. Then it goes into a big capacitor. Then into my ZVS. And into my Tesla coil. Now watch the number one coil on here. It's the copper winding that you see there, a quarter inch copper tube, it's going to start to get hot. You see that we're not getting a whole lot of light. Now you see it smoking. What's going on? It's not resonating properly. Therefore, it's getting feedback from the number two coil into the number one. It's not allowing it to correctly oscillate. Therefore, it's going to set on fire. Now, is this a bad thing in our gravity flyer? Yes, too much of it is a bad thing. However, a little bit of it is a good thing. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, there's a reason why. I always talk about pent-up energy inside the number one coil of your gravity flyer when you start doing this kind of thing. When you want to put the feedback in there, what are you doing? You're forcing it to not oscillate correctly. Therefore, energy builds up in heat and energy in the number one coil. Now, when you release that to the correct oscillation, you're going to get all of that pent-up energy, forcing itself back to the gravity flyer. This is why Alexei does it. He's getting a huge amount of energy, but he also is getting heat. That heat will now flip the center plate in your gravity flyer from cold energy to hot energy 
for just a few seconds, just as long as it takes for that energy feedback to get pushed back to the gravity flyer and then dissipate. This is going to change the actual gravity flyer. It is going to go from a center plate that is charged and it's going to flip it into a magnetic plate. That's what you're going to see when you see the field flip. That's why we know everything went from positive and negative in the field to complete negative inside the field. It's because of that switch right there. Let's take a look at the infrared one more time. On the left, we can clearly see the field. On the right, I identify the field. Then, let's take a look at it a little closer. We can actually see the field forming around it. What is this stuff in the air? It's heat. There's heat being produced by this whole thing once the field flips. It's how he's getting this. It's heat. It's energy. It's energy swirling. He's starting to get energy pulled into this. Now, what happens when you have a Tesla coil in a high voltage field? You get leakage. That's what that little stuff flying is. It's all the leakage from the field. That's how he knows it's all filled up with energy. I know some of you are out there wondering why I'm working with a ZVS instead of a Slayer Exciter circuit. It's because I have a whole box full of transistors that I've exploded. And every time I get heat back to the number one coil, I immediately blow up the transistor. It doesn't matter how many diodes I use, it's not working. I wanted to use the ZVS circuit because it's strong. It allows me to screw up as many times as I want. As you can see here, I can set that wire on fire. But that ZVS circuit right there is still kicking. It's still working. It still allows me to be dumb and set more stuff on fire. Now, what does that mean for our gravity flyer here? It means that when I get feedback, it's going to be tough enough to take it. Then it's going to be tough enough to dish it back out to the gravity flyer. It's exactly what I'm looking for in a circuit. I want the strength of the circuit. Now, one tricky part about this whole ZVS circuit that most people don't know until you build it is it's a hairpin between being perfect and being completely out of resonance. It'll have a major drop off. What does that mean for our uh, gravity flyer here? It means that we can push back on it with a very slight amount of power and we can get it to flip from in resonance to out of resonance. Therefore, we're getting exactly what we want in our feedback. We're going to shove it out of resonance, build up the energy, put it back in resonance, and push it right back out to the gravity flyer. It's absolutely the perfect circuit for this. It's easy to do. All you have to do is take the ZVS, remove the capacitors and put in two high voltage, high frequency capacitors. That's it. That's the low UF number. 0.75 is what I have between the two when they're sitting here like just like in this configuration. So it's perfect for this circuit. It's absolutely perfect for what we want to do. It's going to give us everything that Alexi's coil is doing. Here's a look at the Tesla coil for my gravity flyer. Now this thing operates in a whole different way than a normal Tesla coil because we have the gravity flyer attached. So I'm going to explain that now. The next coil we're going to take a look at is for my gravity flyer. Now this coil is a little bit different. It runs on a ZVS driver so it has to be anywhere from 300 to 350 kilohertz is where it normally runs at on the uh, ZVS driver. So. One of the greatest things about this coil is when you add the gravity flyer as capacitance to the coil, it'll actually get right in the correct spot around 340, I believe it is, kilohertz on this coil. I went ahead and looked at it earlier, and I just want to show that to you now. Right now, I'm checking out the capacitance with my gravity flyer connected to my Tesla coil. 340 kilohertz is where I'm at. Now, as I drop this a little bit, right about there, kind of in this area, 200 to 220, somewhere in that area is where I get feedback. We bring it back up 
this right here is about where I want to be on my resonance now. So again, if I have it here, I can go back to here, and that's where I get feedback, and then automatically jump back to here. So that's perfect. That's what this coil right here that I built a little while back. It's the two inch coil with uh, 28 gauge wiring. Now you'll see the wire right here on top of my coil. It's connected right here. Now that goes down and around. It's just connected right here to my gravity flyer. So my gravity flyer adds capacitance to this coil. So let's see what happens. I can get that off of there. There we go. Now, I just unhooked it. Now I'm at the same frequency, but it's no good no more. No, nope, not what we want. This is where this Tesla coil operates without the gravity flyer on it. So 694. Wow, that's a lot of capacitance for that gravity flyer right there. We're looking in the 360, so 400, uh, somewhere around there. So three, yeah. No, it's 350. About 350 is what we're looking at right there. So 350 kilohertz is what that gravity flyer eats right there. That's crazy. So we know where resonance is on this coil, but the gravity flyer adds so much to it. I thought it was important that everybody be able to see that. Now when we look at this Tesla coil here, just understand this. It's going to be a resonance coil. It is not going to be a sparking coil. However, I do want to show you this video here. It is a, my ZVS Tesla coil that I produce sparks out of. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is I want you to see the circuit. I want you to see exactly how strong it is. I wanted to give everybody a quick look at my ZVS Tesla coil. It's wound with 32 gauge of magnet wire and it is on a 4 inch pipe. I have a resonant frequency in my number two coil of 320 kilohertz. We're using quarter inch copper tubing here on the number one coil. And I'm running the ZVS circuit. Now, the only thing I did was take the capacitors out of this slot here, unsoldered them, and then I soldered in two capacitors here. So it runs. Right here, I'll show you the ground from the number two goes right here. It goes into ground from the wall. And then right here, you can follow the cables along. Here's how we're getting our half bridge on the AC side. And show you this right here. It looks wrong because the diodes are backwards, but it's absolutely right. This is the negative cable going in and this one is the positive and yes it does it does seem backwards but it's a hundred percent true it goes in just like that and then the other side of that whole cable goes over here to my variac and it's putting out ac power not dc so we are in ac right now when we run this thing and I'll just show you here the wave. Here's your normal sine wave. And then here's what we're getting out of it now. We're just getting a half wave, okay, on a bridge. So normally the wave would come up here and go down here and then go back up over here. But instead we're getting the little humps and we're just getting a half wave. Now, I went ahead and set up a thing here so you could see the sparks and stuff. This right here is where our tip is. Went straight across at their base, which is... This part, the base, tip, end of the tip here, and I got a scale right here. So what I'm going to do is plug this thing in, and then we're going to fire it up, and we'll see exactly where we're at. I'm going to turn off the lights as well. Put this here in the tripod. Should give us a pretty good view of this thing. I'm going to plug it in real quick.
All right, we are ready to go. Let's take a look at this. Turn it on. Variac on. As soon as we turn it, we're getting breakout. We have about eight inches, getting close to nine. That was just cool. I absolutely love the sparks. However, the only thing that we're going to transfer from this one to our Tesla coil for our gravity flyer is the circuit itself. Now, I will not be using AC in this circuit. I'm going to use DC in this circuit. As you can see, I have a bench power supply that's DC. It only goes to 30 volts, so we're going to get relatively low voltage in this test. But I want you to understand the difference. This one's going to put out mostly resonance because it's DC. The other one was AC, so you saw all the sparks. Now, I'm going to get about 48 inches of distance out of this at about 21 to 23 volts. As we can see, it goes right out there. It goes right down to 21. Here we go. We're going to do it again. We got it. Guys, it lights up pretty bright at relatively low voltage of DC. Again, this is exactly what we're looking for for our gravity flyer. Now, the whole thing is, can we get the resonance without the spark? And that's to get the cold energy. And the answer is yes. Not really a problem when the gravity flyer is connected in. That'll actually extinguish because of the mass of the gravity flyer. Because it brings it down 360 kilovolts, or excuse me, kilohertz, then you can understand why we're not getting any breakout. It'll only produce the cold energy we're looking for. Now we saw Alexi stuff. We saw exactly where the heat's going. We saw what we need to do our Tesla coil. We know what we have to do to our high voltage. What does that mean for us? Now that we have this Tesla coil built, we have the correct circuit, it's time to test again. I cannot tell you how excited I am for this. Last time I tested, I blew out six transistors within a matter of about, what, 40 minutes? I exploded one right after another, after another, after another. This circuit, I trust the fact that it's going to hold up. As a matter of fact, I went ahead and bought several more boards, and I'm ready to go. So, I start tomorrow in setting this coil into resonance with the gravity flyer. Should take me about a day. It takes a little while to get used to where the drop-off point is. I'm going to set it. Friday, I should be testing. I'm looking to push this thing. Guys, this is the time I've been waiting for. We know where the fields are. We know where the energy is going. We know where the heat's going. We know how long it takes to build this thing up. This is our time. This Tesla coil has been the bane of my existence for the last month. I've had a busted hand with gout filled into it. I haven't been able to work. Now that I'm back at it, I can't tell you how excited I am to get this thing completely done. I'm ready for it to do something exciting. So, hopefully, let's cross our fingers. Let's get this going. It's testing coming Friday. And, man, do I ever want this thing just to do something. Lift a little bit, bump off the ground, man, and we are ready to go. Anyway... If you like what you saw here today, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. Do all those fun things. Get ready for an awesome day of testing on Friday, and have yourself a great day. Thank you.